Um, welcome to MAOS 2022 in person. Woo, woo, woo. There you go. So, um, yeah, I whipped up a little slideshow uh, just to try to explain what I've been working on as far as exec SG. So I'll get into what exec SG is right away here first. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if I should use a white font or a black font, but anyway, it sort of worked. Um, so a brief review of what exec SG is, because that's what I'm um, leading a team on right now. So exec SG is a collection of software components uh, making up what we call the kernel of the Amigo S, Amigo S4 I'm talking about. So it's got quite a few different pieces. So you got exec library, which is kind of like your kernel in uh, you know, Linux, whatever. And then there's various other libraries and resources and uh, utilities that uh, go around that. Um, this particular, we call it exec SG because it's second generation. So exec, which runs on your 68K computers, that's uh, Carl Sassenrath's creation uh, for Commodore, or not Commodore, Amiga, which became Commodore Amiga and all that. We know the story. Um, exec SG was heavily inspired by exec, but exec was mostly assembly, so they had to rewrite it from scratch and make it compatible on the power PC. So that's, uh, that's why it's called exec SG instead of exec. So just an explanation. So current status. So last year, I did a little blurb. And I looked back and, and I saw, well, what's changed since that little blurb last year? So I've listed a few things here. Um, uh, there was a lot of effort into the FSL DMA resource which is a, uh, a software component which accesses the DMA hardware that's built into the X5000 and the A1222. So there's this DMA hardware that sits in there. It's a general purpose DMA hardware, which can move massive amounts of data very fast uh, without involving the CPU. So that's what it is. And um, one thing we did do was we... Um, reserved a couple of channels, DMA channels, for the A1222 audio driver uh, so that it, it can use DMA because that's the only way uh, you can get smooth audio from the audio driver. Uh, we expen extended it with 64-bit support so that it can move data from anywhere on an expansion card to anywhere in Amigo OS. So that, that's good. Um, we also experimented, did some, some wild experiments uh, with the DMA copying as a general purpose copy routine. So those on the beta test team, maybe LD here and various others, remember that we uh, crunched through a few scenarios and we had some switches to turn it on and off, change the threshold on and off. And uh, overall, I was left with slightly unimpressed because Amigo S tends to do small copies most of the time. So we're, we're talking less than 64K. So the DMA hardware doesn't really shine until you get to the larger copies, like you know, uh, 100K, uh, megabyte. Then it really kicks butt. But uh, on the smaller copies, eh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't as nice as I'd hoped it would be. You know? <laughs> so it, it's, it's nice, but not great. Um, there was also an experiment to, to play with uh, DMA with the web browser. What is that called? Uh, yeah, yeah, the uh, Odyssey, was it? Yeah, Odyssey, yeah, yeah, Odyssey web browser. Played with that for a bit. It helped a little bit there, yeah, because it's larger chunks of data. So anyway, uh, th I'm hoping that we can get this released ASAP. Have to talk to Trevor, but uh, <laughs> and uh, Hyperion as well, and and get that out in the wild so that everyone can play with it. Um, if you have uh, the latest SDK done by George, thank you, George. <laughs> it's right there. Um, if you have that, you have the latest uh, interface to actually do these DMA copies. But you need the kernel that goes along with it; otherwise, it doesn't do much. 
So that's my next, uh, my next task when I return home. And uh, we also have updated performance monitor, which is really cool because uh, that's a way to do profiling with the CPU. And uh, uh, what's his name? Massimo was the, uh, was the architect there, and he did it on a whim. So you have A1222 support and X5000 support, which is awesome. This is very important for fine-tuning software. Uh, there's a new memory mapping for a CPLD part, which most of you probably don't care about, but we do. <laughs> That's really cool. Uh, you might be some, see, see some cool utilities come out for that. And uh, another thing that is kind of a little bit of a little bit of controversy with this reschedule function. So there's this exec has a, a very, uh, very primitive scheduler. It's a round robin scheduler with priorities. Very, very primitive. And um, once in a while, you have to give it a kick <laughs> when you've been messing with, uh, with task schedules. And we, uh, we exposed this function called reschedule. And uh, that was an accident. And of course, somebody saw it. Somebody used it anyway, even though we said not to. And then as soon as I made it private, I got yelled at. <laughs> you can't make it private. <laughs> so we, the team went back and discussed it for a while. And I, I said, well, should we really keep this going or not? Because it's a, it's a potentially bad thing to have, um, to have exposed. Because uh, if you've done any OS programming, usually you're not allowed to play with the scheduler very much. And there's a good reason for that. Um, and this is, this is the same thing with Amiga. So in, in the end, the guys said we should expose it. So uh, wrote, I wrote up an auto doc. It's in the SDK now officially. So those two people, I think, that use it, uh, Hans and uh, I can even name them, Hans and Sebastian. There you go. Two people in the world need this function. Now they have it. So they're happy for a while. <laughs> I mentioned that. Um, <clears throat> Multicore, this is interesting. So uh, we've been working hard on this multi-core kernel. Uh, that means it uses both cores on your X5020 or four cores on the 40. And uh, it's made some good progress since last time. Uh, we've got the public demo, which is over at the Eon tab table, which shows not, not a very exciting demo because we couldn't get it to stop crashing, you know, the usual Amiga problem. But it is working. You can see two cores up because we got a 20 machine over there and they both are running two tasks at the same time. And you can actually see them and they're there. So it, it actually runs. <laughs> so I thought I mentioned that. Um, so those, uh, those who are here at the show, you can actually come over, ask some questions and I can delve deeper. Uh, one thing we had to do is we had to buy a JTAG debugger. Uh, this is a very low level debugger because we have a, a check exception problem at the, with the hardware that randomly pops up. So it's, I don't know if you know anything about these modern CPUs, but they tend to crash and keep running for a while, run to the end, and then you don't know exactly where it died, right? So you have to go back in time if you don't have a JTAG debugger. You can't catch these things. So we bought one, and uh, of course, we plug it in, and, well, oh no, no, I, I should back up a little bit. Of course, we can't plug it in. Thomas, our main developer, has no connector on his board to plug it into. For some reason, they didn't populate the connector. <laughs> so Thomas whips out his soldering iron, <laughs> solders on the connector, okay, fine. Okay, now, now we want to plug it in, but we're not sure of the pinout. We can't find the schematics. <laughs> you know, so it goes on and on and on. So finally we plug it in. Good. Fire up the software. It reads zeros. The vendor lied. It doesn't really, it isn't really compatible with this chip. You're kidding me. <laughs> so what do we do? Call up Matthew, Trevor. We need a board sent to the vendor so that they can get their software updated so we can actually use their debugger. <laughs> so, 
I'm having fun. Okay. <laughs> this is supposed to be buy it, plug it in, works. Right? So that, that's, this is my life. Anyway, um, so that's just to get rid of the final hurdle because uh, what, what we have implemented is all the features are there, but it's not stable. And we've got to get stable. Um, I think it has to do with interrupts, interrupting at the bad times, you know, the usual issues that you get with the multi-core system. Anyway, we're going to figure it out. Hopefully soon. I know I said this last year, but <laughs> anyway, at least all the software is there now. It, bef last year, actually, the software wasn't there. There was no multi-core scheduling. That was that wasn't implemented. So this is this is good. Um, we also have core affinity, which is a way of saying prefer this core versus that core. You know, so you you can actually on the API you can say I want to run on core one, I want to run on core two, and you can state it in the software, which is pretty cool. Um, there's some new functions, get system info, task list command, the usual stuff you expect. Uh, I added some new task list functionality because um, if anyone who's done low-level Amiga programming knows that there's, there's no way to get the task list, the list of tasks, without poking around. And well, now there's a way to do it without poking around, and it will tell you which core you're on, too, so it's extra bonus. And last but not least, at the bottom, we have the U-boot. Um, the U-boot that Verisys handed over was not multi-core enabled. This is the firmware, right, in your PC or whatever. It has, when, you're, when your PC boots up, it has to enable the cores before the OS runs. That's part of its job. It wasn't doing it. So we had to go in, say, no, please fire up the cores and give us some data too so that we, our OS can run, right? Very minor change. Uh, but anyway, we, we did that and then while we were in the U-boot, I, um, I got frustrated with a few bugs in there. Uh, there's a long standing bug about it not being able to read the MAC address of the Ethernet cards, of the Ethernet hardware, right? Fixed. So. Um, uh, there was some graphical issues, there was some USB issues, little little things in the firmware that were just annoying, and uh, we fixed them up. And uh, I have actually a private GitHub repository right now where all the relevant uh, developers are, and they're doing whatever they need to if they need to mess with it. Um, and the good, the good news is we're going to release the binary soon, um, from Aeon. So uh, I think it's been tested long enough and uh, I want to get it out there so that when we have the multi-core multi kernel ready, you guys could just uh, install it and it works, right? Instead of upgrade your firmware first and then upgrade the OS and then hope you didn't break anything along the way, right? So I think it's a good idea to get it out there early so that those people that want to can get their USB fixed and their Ethernet fixed, and be multi-core ready. I guess I'll do the ready thing on the package. Here. So that's what I'm working on next. Uh, the roadmap hasn't changed much, except with the addition of the table error, 81222. So while we were waiting for the JTAG vendor to fix the software, I uh, made the decision through Thomas's prodding to start the port to the E1222 because there's no sense waiting who knows how many weeks for them to update it, right? So it's, been, it's begun. It's begun. And the idea is that the E1222 has slightly different uh, CPU and maybe it crashes differently and we might get a hint. So that was the idea, <laughs> right? Because right now we just get a machine check and you got nothing. So the A1222, uh, Thomas was hoping that it crashes softer and he could get some data out of it and maybe make some progress without the JTAG. So that, that was the theory. And we needed to do it anyway. I, I always wanted us to, to focus on the X5000 first, get it running, get it stable, then move it. So you say, well, okay. Yes. Anyway. Whoops, what's that? Uh, anyway. Um, Got the audio fixed there? Okay, are we good? Okay. <laughs> and then there's a few other things like uh, start DMA and DMA, uh, these routines, low-level stuff that um, 
we should fix. Uh, a bigger feature is add 64-bit support to the kernel, which is uh, a bigger effort necessary to access more RAM and all that good stuff, more I.O. and better logging system. So the, the, lo the roadmap really hasn't changed much since last year, except with the addition of the 1222. That's it. And then um, there's, a, there's a plug for my tools, anyway. This is, this is not much to do with ExecSG, except I needed, um, I needed multi-platform tools to actually build the kernel. So I built a few little ones and stuck them on GitHub. They're, they're GPL, they're free. If anyone wants to grab the code, fork the code, give me a patch or a pull request, I'll gladly accept it, right? So just, just a few tools that are necessary to build the kernel that I needed. And they're, they're written in a special version of Python, 2.5, because 2.5 is the version the Amiga OS 4 has right now. So it runs on Python 2.5 and Python 3.11 or whatever the current run is. Does both. It's compatible. So, <laughs> so that means it runs on everything. It run, everything on the planet that has Python. So that, that, that can be handy for the developers out there, right? Uh, also a plug for Spotless 2. Um, uh, Elf Kill, is that how you pronounce his name? Okay, okay, thank you. Um, he said, yeah, I've got this new Spotless 2. It's a source level debugger. Great little thing. Uh, he's been hacking at it. He's on the exec SG team, so whenever he needs changes to the kernel or fixes, that we try to make it happen. So that's why it says requires beta kernel on there, right, the fourth line. It's like, well, so I'm telling you, go get Spotless 2, but you can't run it. So we got to get the new kernel out there for you guys. <laughs> Working on it. So, and uh, I gave a I gave a, a very tiny postage stamp snapshot there, but that's you know it's just a standard left side is your source modules, the right side is the source code itself, and then the bottom is registers and all that wonderful stuff. Anyway, uh, Elfkill's been working hard on this, and he has a PayPal address. So, <laughs> if anyone wants to help help him out. Please do, and it's on OS4 Depot. It's a it's a great little debugger. And then uh, I wanted to mention the development team. Um, there's all the people that are actually on our team right now, and uh, they're they're all contributing in their own ways. So uh, some people do code, some people just review docs, some people just provide criticism, some people review. Depends what their mood is, right? <laughs> and uh, I wanted to mention the, the logo is designed by a local, <laughs> might have heard of, uh, Mr. Lester there. And uh, Trevor Dickinson is actually the product owner, which is a, a little strange, because Hyperion has the rest of the OS, but Trevor Dickinson owns the kernel. So I just wanted to mention that. It's a little odd, but Hyperion has a a uh, license to ship binaries, and uh, thus that's that's the situation as it is today. So <laughs> it's a long, convoluted story. <laughs> anyway, that's that's where we're at. And uh, oh, where's the question slide? Huh? Okay. It disappeared. Okay, so uh, I'll just leave it at, at this slide. So if you have any questions. Uh, please fire away. Um, not going to go ham. Uh, Brian there. Oh, yes, yes, 1,000. I didn't even mention it, right? Yeah. So, uh, I can't hear you very well either. Oh, X1000, well, X1000 in general. Uh, so the X1000, we want to do a port to that. That's after the 1222, I should say, because I don't want to miss the 1222 launch, right? Because Trevor, well, what, what is it? Enrico said January. I was like, uh-oh, I don't have much time. Uh, and Trevor just said Q1. Uh-oh, <laughs> right? So, uh-oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> I really wanted to have multi-core available for the 1222 ASAP, right? But of course, you know, plans and all that. And then after that, the X1000, um, we have the same problem on there. You need the firmware updated to start up the cores, right? Well, the good news is we found the source code. <laughs> we lost it. Then we found it. Then we lost it. And we found, you know, <laughs> Douglas Adams. <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> So uh, we have the source code. I've, I've tried to work on it for a while. Um, and uh, Val was my tester. And we got it to compile eventually. So that's one. But it didn't work the first try. The first try, I put, put it in the X1000, it just goes eh. So <laughs> I have to put some more hours into that, figure out what is going eh, if you will. It's just black screen, right? Because it's firmware, right? So you just you get black screen. You're lucky you get screen, actually, <laughs> in firmware. <laughs> so I have to figure out why the new compilers don't work, newer compilers don't work. Um, it, when I got the CFE code, it had a make script in there that mentioned 386. So I was like, did, was this thing compiled on a 386? <laughs> like cross-compiled, right? <laughs> odd, odd. Anyway, so I, I'm, I'm trying all sorts of different uh, virtual machines to find the right one that will compile this thing and give me a binary that works. That's what I'm working on now, right? Because the code is too old to bring up to a modern compiler. You just can't do it without massive effort. So. You try to go backwards in time with virtual machines, right? Yeah. So, so once we get that to work, then I can put the multi-core support in there, and then we can port it over, right? Uh, the good news is the the low-level stuff is is pretty much I don't know what percentage, 90% compatible, right? Because there is some assembly, um, some assembly required. <laughs> Uh, for for the uh, for the kernel, but not a lot. Uh, we we wrote the schedule rewrote the scheduler in C, for example, the main scheduler, and uh, that's why, so that we could port it to the X1000 when the day came, right? So it's coming, but it's uh, it's lowest on the list. So sorry, X1000 owners, Un unless the uh, unless Trevor orders me to, <laughs> he could. You could lobby Trevor and say, get that done first. Okay. Anyway, uh, Paul, you had a question? Uh, it's also about the X1000, but I'm also curious, outside of multi-core, what other improvements you made to the kernel? Like, for example, the, the memory transfer, and does it support Jamie's Ethernet driver and all that? Okay, so the question was, uh, uh, the other stuff in the kernel? Did I get that right? Like the like the uh, Ethernet stuff and whether stuff was improved in the kernel. So, well, there's, there's the usual list of bugs. I, I didn't bother to put them on a slide or anything because, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty boring to people. Um, but there are quite a few changes and quite a few fixes that we found along the way, too. And um, nothing really broke, but things got faster in some areas and a little bit slower in other areas, depending on what we fixed, because we were, me we're messing with the lowest level stuff, the mutexes, the semaphores, all that wonderful stuff, right? And uh, that, can really, that can really change the dynamics of your system really, really rapidly. Um, so I, can, I don't want to point out anything as specific, but there are quite a few fixes. And uh, I do want to get this kernel out, so we just got to negotiate with Hyperion and, uh, and Trevor and figure out how we can get it to you guys. How are we going to deliver it? I mean, I could just give you a file, but uh, it's not very professional. And another question over there? Uh, last year you said that uh, the multi-core support was written three times. Yes. Yeah, and that's the, actually the third time. Uh, can you explain uh, how it is working, uh, how the applications are starting, uh, and uh, especially the old uh, applications? How are they working on the each core? Does the, uh, the kernel choose what core is going to, to yeah. be used? Well, I'll try to distill it down. Basically, it's um, how 
more detail on how the actual multicore works, right? Like, how, how, how does it work? Is it magic? Yeah, I can't think. Well, um, I'll, I'll, I won't go too deep because the crowd probably fall asleep, but what we do is everything, the whole OS runs on core zero, right? You, can run, you start at core zero, that's the, the initial core, everything runs on there. And then um, as you launch tasks, like after you boot it up, as you launch applications and everything, uh, we start to randomly choose other cores. And so it's just a random thing right now. Uh, you know, in, in, a, in a more, uh, more polished OS, you're going you're gonna to pick the lowest busy core, right? So we'll add that to later, but right now I just want to see it work, right? So, so that's, that's the stage we're at, where I can, launch, I can launch another task on a different core. I can say, force it, you're going to run a core one. Or you can just let the OS choose the core, and it'll just like go back and forth when you have two cores. Let's go zero, one, zero, one, zero. Because we like to start at zero for some reason. Um, <laughs> but it's invisible to the applications, which is the cool part. Right? So the application doesn't know if it's running on this core or that core. Now, they are pinned to the core, though, because we can't move them between cores without really breaking stuff. So we, once it's launched, it stays on that core. So that's a kind of a restriction right now, just to simplify things. Um, and it's amazing how, uh, how Thomas was able to change the API or not change the API and make it run. That, that part's kind of magical, kind of, uh, I, 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 or maybe the word's proprietary, because I did ask, I said, could I share the details and how that works? And then, no, <laughs> not right now. <laughs> how it really works, right? So I can't, I can't delve into the really works, because I, I, I thought this question would pop up. Like, how does it really work? You get a coder who asks. It's like, no, not right now. Uh, we're, we're gonna, first, we're going to get working. And then we'll decide how much is divulged on the internal, the actual really internals. Because it, uh, I, I, I can say it's simple. It's simple. It's not a complicated thing. It's not complicated. But uh, because the Amigo S API was designed with a single user, single core in mind, it's very hard to change. Thomas says thanks on YouTube. Oh, OK. <laughs> Thomas says thanks. <laughs> Oh, no, I'm being watched. <laughs> yes? So, if runs on one core and creates other threads, those threads run on the same core. And what happens with the memory? Oh, uh, so the question is about threads. Um, really, really, like what happens? Um, in, in other OSs, usually have a distinction between a process and a thread. A uh, process is something that has a, a uh, address space and a single address space, and it's got memory, and it just lives there. And a thread lives within that address space, right? And so it's a lightweight process, usually we call them, right? Well, Amiga doesn't have this concept, so it's not really a problem. <laughs> so I'm trying to say, right? It's a single unified memory address space right now. And uh, when you launch a new task, you could call it a thread if you want. It's not a thread. Uh, but uh, an interesting there's a little bit of history, though. Uh, threads have been attempted in the past. Thread, threading has been attempted. I know um, I asked uh, Thomas about this once, and they were thinking about adding real threads. So they were talking threads that work within another task. So you have a task, and then threads work within it. But it, it, it was never flushed out for some reason. I, I'm not sure why, but it's pos still possible that we could have true threads in Amigo S. It's possible, right? And uh, the more we, the more we um, segment the memory, the more that becomes something we're going to have to do, right, to get performance. Because the whole reason to have threads is to make it run faster. Why else have a thread, right? It's, it's just no point. Just use process. Fork, 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 fork. <laughs> Here in Linux or Unix world, sorry. <laughs> oh, another question, Paul. So you're touching on the, the forks and threads and memory. Ports and threads and memory seem to be a big part of both the ports from Linux. They always want the ports and the threads. 
and yeah. memory for the sake of stability, memory protection, or any of those things creeping into the work you guys have done with the x x x s g mm -hmm. to provide us with either that protection or those threads? Okay, so uh, I'll try to distill that down. Yeah, they, basically, I, I think uh, what, what he's asking there is uh, in your in your Linux or Windows or whatever Mac arena, they have uh, memory protection, they have threads, processes, and, and a lot of restrictions, right? And uh, it's to make everything run more stable is the idea, but it, you also pay a penalty, because you always, it gets a little bit slower every time you throw another feature on. Um, is that starting to creep into Amigo OS, right? And I, I'd say yes, yes, it has crept in, um, especially on the memory side of things. So y yes, it's a far more complicated memory system, and, uh, but you don't really notice, but you pay. There, there's a penalty. It's not free, right? And uh, same thing with memory protection schemes. Uh, the hardware only assists you so much, and then you gotta you gotta do some more work around that, right? So it is creeping in. Um, whether that translates to frames per second or not, it has. It has. Like I've seen uh, reports from uh, good old Castle and friends that the FPS dropped when we changed the mutexes and something, right? Well, we changed that because the memory system changed, because, you know, there's always a reason, and that's because it's creeping in there, it's getting a little slower, so it killed off like two or three FPS, and it's like, ah! Oh. And uh, I, I had to make the executive decision to keep going anyway, you know, <laughs> it's, cause it's a tough one, it's a tough one. It it do, will it pro provide more protection? Yes, yes, it does. Yeah, it will provides. It will it make it easier to port stuff? That's a good question. Um, things have changed now in the computing world with uh, with multiprocessing. There's the languages now have threading and multiprocessing built into the language, right? The language itself, not the OS. So the, the language does it for you. Uh, they do use OS services to pull it off, but the language does it. So it's not like the good old days uh, when you had to do it all yourself, right? Now we have uh, like futures and all these tricks to just hide all of this complexity because what happened was it turned out humans suck really bad at multi-core processing or multi-core programming. They suck real bad, not just bad, bad. <laughs> So we had to change our programming languages to help them because we just can't do it. Humans can't do it. That's been proven. So nowadays, it's basically the language that's doing the work for you. Your C++, like your Go, Java to, let, to an extent, all that stuff. Python even. <laughs> um, so what we have to do is we take, we put in language support into the OS. So for example, I had a request. Oh, I got that. Stop hitting keys button. Um, I got a request uh, a while ago to fix, fix an API function to do stuff once. You wouldn't think that'd be a problem. In a multi-core, it's a very difficult problem. So you want to do something once, and only once. And you don't want any other cores to mess it up. Well, we don't have a way to do that in MigOS right now. You have to do stop task scheduling check this thing and then start it again, right? Which is not appropriate. So uh, that request came in. I haven't uh, had it serviced yet, but we're gonna add an API for this. Uh, this is to support higher level languages. This, I think that's C or C++ in this case. So I, did, I, did I answer your question a little bit? Because it, things have changed a lot in the last decade or two with multi-threading programming. So I've got yeah. two uh, one of them is uh, when you compile Uru, uh, can you add NVMe support, which is fun. And then the other one is uh, can you improve or release more documentation around writing kernel modules uh, and drivers and whatnot? Okay, so everyone's got the question. I don't have to repeat it. You do have to repeat it. I have to repeat it? Oh, bugger. Okay. <laughs> Okay, U-Boot, can we add NVMe support, I guess was the question, right? Did you or can you? Did, did I and can I? Uh, no, yes. 
<laughs> there you go. Uh, it should be mentioned also, U-Boot is GPL, so if you want to uh, volunteer, hey, come on up. <laughs> uh, what, was, what was the other question again? <laughs> uh, the other question was around documentation for Doc developing kernel modules. Documentation for kernel modules. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, that is something I should have done five years ago. I completely forgot. <laughs> It's not hard, but there's no docs. I know, I know. I, 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 learned it, I learned it too. You have to do this little trick here, and you have to not do this. And then it's a kernel module. It's, but we never wrote it down. So, that, yeah, I, I better do this. Um, thank, <laughs> thanks for the reminder. <laughs> uh, we, we do have a wiki, right? There's a wiki.amigos.net. I just have to stick an article there. It wouldn't take long. I just got to do it. Apologies. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Robert has? Yes. Uh, Matthew Lehman tells me that uh, for Amiga OS 4.1 and all the enhancers software that has been released with it, and now with multi core support, that in essence, 4.1 has now become 4.2, or what originally was planned for a release for OS 4.2. Is yes. that correct? Yes, so the question is uh, with the enhancer and the multi-core and all this stuff uh, added together, basically it's become Amiga OS 4.2, right? And uh, I can't remember which year, but it was announced at this show that 4.2 will have, what was it, 3D graphics, multi-core, and something else, memory protection or something or other. And so. Uh, What's going on with 4.2? So that's, um, that's, a, that's a good question because so many years have passed now, it makes you wonder what, what it should be called <laughs> at all. But uh, uh, I'd have to ask Hyperion because I don't, I don't represent Hyperion, but I think it's dangerously close to being called 4.2. Yes, yes, dangerously close. And, um, I, I didn't think of the the public release aspect of it. Like uh, I just want to get it out there, right? So we're we're marching towards. We're going to get it multi-core ready, and then one day we're going to say, "Here, have it." What do we call that? And do we charge money for it? That's not my department, but uh, I have to figure this out, right? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, if you recall, if you bought an X1000. Uh, you were promised a free copy of 4.2. That was, when was the X1000 released? That was very public, right? And it, it, I, asked, uh, I asked Hyperion, oh, a year or two ago, if this is still true. And I was told it's still true. But is it true now? I don't know. Like the day, right this minute. They, they did not renege on that offer. So uh, as far as I know, X1000 owners still get a free 4.2 or whatever it's going to be called. Um, but uh, anyway, that, that's a good question. That's a good question. And uh, George, you had? Given to the users uh, free of charge, do you have any idea about that? And which is given? The, the kernel, the new kernel, is going to go to the user free. Sorry, I can't quite kernel. understand. Kernel. Oh, the new kernel. Oh, kernel. Okay, sorry. Accent. Yeah. I have trouble. Sorry. <laughs> so the new kernel, yeah. See, I'll, I'll release the, the kernel for free as long as I can. Like, we should get this new uh, kernel out. I, I should mention that the beta kernel have multi-core in it. Right? It's, there's two kernels now. There's a single-core kernel and a multi-core kernel, and I build both. And uh, the multi-core is a separate kernel. So when I say I'm going to release the beta kernel, I mean the regular one, the more uh, the single-core kernel, I guess you call it, right? Yeah, that's what, it, what I meant. <laughs> Any other questions? Waiting on Bill. Uh, I don't think so. Okay, good. Okay, thank you very much. Okay.